All right. All right. Okay, now we're recording. Now you can uh, go ahead with the introductions. Okay. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, uh, and uh, let me just thank everybody who spoke earlier today, and, and thank you all for attending. It's it's been amazing seeing and hearing about all of these different talks about bees from all over the world, and and just the diversity of people, the diversity of topics, the diversity of questions is is, is really uh, amazing. So thank you all. Okay, uh, it is uh, my absolute pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Uh, professor Hollis Woodard is an associate professor of entomology at the University of California, Riverside, which I just learned has no river. So I was like, mind blown. Uh, so uh, Professor uh, Hollis uh, obtained her PhD from the hallowed halls of moral at the Department of Entomology at the University of Illinois uh, under the tutelage of Dr. Jean Robinson. Uh, she then follows up with a USDA NIFA postdoctoral fellowship working with Dr. Uh, Shailene Jha at uh, uh, Texas, Austin, Texas, uh, University of Texas in Austin, <laughs> which seems like Texas is going to get another Tim Hortons. So anyway, the, my world, my mind is blown yet again. Uh, and then she started her uh, uh, faculty position uh, at uh, uh, UC uh, uh, Riverside. And uh, she's currently leading uh, the US National Native Bee Monitoring Network, which is really cool. So uh, yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you've all, I, I, part of the reason that uh, we invited uh, uh, Professor Hollis here is that her lab has just been kind of a wonderful hub of activity with everything related to bumblebees. And I know, I know it's just been really fascinating following up her awesome research and, and all of the other work that she does to kind of promote bees and, and conservation. So uh, please join us in uh, welcoming Dr. Hollis Withert. Thank you so much. Let me get my screen share going. I practice this so I can make sure. How does that look? Looks like right. you're giving me a thumbs up, but I think that's just his, his photo. <laughs> yeah, you're good, Hollis. OK, awesome. Um, well, thank you for that introduction. We did meet in the hallowed halls of Moral Hall. <laughs> um, I really appreciate the invitation to give the, the keynote presentation for this conference. Um, my only regret is that I couldn't be there in person to hang out with Amro, Jen, kids, old friends, new friends. Um, thank you for being accommodating and let, letting me um, do this virtually, though. It's not as, as much fun, so I'm hoping I get to see everyone in the not too distant future. Um, in another place and another time. Um, so when most of us, myself included, think about you social insects, we usually think about um, the part of their life cycle where they're at the sort of apex of social complexity. Um, we think about the mature colony stage and, um, you know, these. this is the stage in the life cycle where sociality is at its most complex. These colonies have all the benefits of sociality. Um, they have a, a coordination and cooperation among nest mates, you know, with some caveats. Um, they have uh, a queen um, who is influencing the behavior and often suppressing the reproduction of workers in the nest. Um, colony homeostasis, I could go on. <laughs> You know, when we think of youth social lineages, we, or at least I, I tend to automatically think about um, the mature colony stage and all the amazing and interesting and complex things about it. And this is really why I originally became interested in studying social insects um, at all. Um, <clears throat> but I've been instead thinking about a, a flip side of this coin lately, and I've, I've become really interested in it. And I'm going to talk about um, the something that many use social insect lineages um, do that is kind of special and is not to do with this really complex stage in their life cycle. Um, and instead, a lot of the use social insect lineages, um, when we think about how they function at certain certain part of their life cycle, um, there's actually some inspiration we might be able to gain instead from thinking about something more like um, a young bird nest where um, mom and sometimes dad um, care for offspring and have to really get things going. And um, 
they don't have all the benefits of sociality. So I'm going to try to convince you that we can learn some things potentially because of the life cycle um, of many of the youth social and psych lineages that might make you think that we could gain some insight from instead studying something like a young bird nest or maybe at least um, a bearing beetle um, nest or, or um, uh, group. So uh, all the work I do, as Amra mentioned, is in bumblebees. Um, maybe one day I'll really branch out, but for now I have plenty to work on and I imagine working on them for the rest of my life. Um, bumblebees have this life cycle. Well, most of the bumblebees have a life cycle where for the overwhelming majority of their life, um, queens are solitary. So they're spending most of their life um, usually underground in a state of diapause. And it's only in the spring um, that they emerge. So the top um, right um, part of this figure where queens emerge um, from overwintering and they have to be single moms and take care of nests on their own. They seek out nest sites and provision them and begin to lay eggs. And it's really only once they lay eggs and stick around that they become uh, they express sociality in any form. Um, when those first eggs develop in the nest and moms are caring for and directly provisioning their larval um, offspring, at this stage, this is really the kind of mama bird stage where the, the bumblebee queens are progressively feeding their, their larval offspring. They're providing other forms of care that I'm gonna mention too. Um, and at this stage, they're really subsocial. They are exhibiting extended parental care, but they're not eusocial yet. Um, it's only when their first brood um, emerge as adults in the nest that they actually transition to living a eusocial lifestyle. And so the thing I've been thinking about a bunch and what I'm going to talk about today is those stages essentially between the time when a queen has come out from overwintering and is developing her ovaries and seeking out a nest site from that period until the time that her first offspring stay in the nest and she actually becomes eusocial and what we can learn um, from studying that little stage of the life cycle. So um, a little bit of terminology just to get everyone on the same page is that um, this lifestyle that I just described for bumblebee queens and that I told you queens and many other eusocial insect lineages do too is referred to as independent founding. Queen is independently founding her nest. And the alternative to that is dependent founding. This is when queens are founding nests with other individuals. And this can take different forms. The dependent founding, it can happen through sort of fission or budding from the nest. I'm going to mention later on another example, just very briefly, um, that some in some lineages, like in some polistes species, you see um, multiple founders associations where um, potential queens are working together and, and founding nests together, but that would be another example of something that's um, a dependent type of founding. So you have these two alternative um, sort of ways of doing things. And um, if we look, thank goodness for Cronin et al, who wrote an awesome review about um, where we see dependent and independent colony founding. Um, if we look across the major social insect groups, um, one thing to tell you is that dependent colony founding has evolved multiple times and across all the major groups. Um, but we think independent founding is the more ancestral state and it is still present in all the major eusocial insect groups. So my argument here is that even though I'm going to talk all about bumblebees and my own work on bumblebees, I do want to make the point that I think there's a lot we can learn from shining the same kind of light on some of the other eusocial insect lineages. And in fact, there is some really nice work in these other groups done by other research groups. Um, so, you know, there is some wonderful work out there. But if you look at all eusocial insect research, it is heavily biased towards studying the mature colony stage um, in both the dependent and independent founding um, lineages. And so there's a huge bias in the work that's been done. And I think we can actually learn some pretty important and interesting things about, um, well, all sorts of things that I'm going to talk about, <laughs> about social or organization and evolution from studying um, independent founding in all different um, uh, use social insect groups. Um, here are four of the questions that have been 
rattling around in my mind that have to do with independent founding. And uh, maybe one of them or resonates with you more, but I think they're all really interesting. The first one is whether ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. So this is an idea that was developed in developmental biology that's fallen out of favor to some extent because, you know, like everything in biology, it doesn't always hold up. But nonetheless, it can be used as a helpful device sometimes for understanding how things evolve. Um, I want to pose the question of whether we can study the developmental transition from solitary to subsocial to eusocial that occurs in the independent found in founding lineages, whether we might use that to try to understand something about how sociality um, evolved in those lineages. Another approach that I myself have taken as well is to study across, compare across species. But of course, that's a, an issue when you're comparing things that evolved um, use sociality, you know, a hundred or so million years ago. And there are many other differences between species um, that are entirely unrelated to social evolution. And so, you know, there's some issues with, with the comparative species approach too. Another way of doing it is to study things that are on the cusp of sociality or exhibit social flexibility, which is a really powerful way to study social evolution. But I just, I just want to pose the idea that maybe we can also study how sociality develops within species across the life cycle to try to understand some things about how sociality possibly evolved. So um, another question that I think we can use these lineages um, for um, in a powerful way is to try to understand how brood care evolves. So brood care um, exists actually in many animal lineages. In the eusocial lineages, you have this and, and some other groups, you have this fun thing where you have not only parental care, but you also have sibling care. So brood care is performed by different individuals. In these systems where across the life cycle, you have mom providing care, and then as siblings emerge and they remain in the nest, you can actually directly compare sibling and maternal care, um, which I think gives you some, some opportunity to, to learn some things about how brood care is regulated, potentially how it evolved. And I'm gonna talk about a couple examples of that next actually. I think too, studying how social regulation functions and develops, you have a, a setup where, you know, mom queen is solitary. She's not receiving any social cues once she leaves her natal nest um, and mates, um, she's on her own. And so she's not receiving any social inputs. And then she lays her first eggs. And well, we tend to think of eggs as being a bit inert in um, social insect world, but that's not necessarily true. They might be giving off important cues as well. Certainly by the time you have larvae in the nest and the larvae are doing things like giving off hunger signals and um, mom is in turn feeding them, um, you start to have some situations where either we know or we could hypothesize that larvae are actually giving off cues pupae as well. And then um, when you have workers in the nest later on too, the, the number and the variety of social cues that might be regulating queen behavior and physiology, they become increasingly complex as the, the colony develops and you have these additional types of group members in the nest. And so maybe by studying <clears throat> queens prior to the point when there are any social cues and then as they kind of move along through development and you have these additional potential cues being added on, maybe we can use that as a, as a sort of device for studying social regulation and how things, for example, evolve to be um, regulating, um, only regulated by themselves and their um, environment and then they ultimately become socially regulated. And that's the subject of some work that I'm doing um, now on um, how feeding regulation changes so in, across the life of the queen. Um, and then I wanna pose the question of whether independent founding relates to conservation status. Um, and here, um, I'm gonna be a little bit more speculative. <laughs> it's something I wanna at least talk about and I wanna make the argument that I think we could potentially learn some things by studying independent founding lineages and the things that, that threaten them. Okay, so I've just talked about how amazing independent founding is and I'm, you know, I love working on it and I, I think we can actually use it to learn a bunch of different things, but you know, just like everything in life, there is a catch and that's that it can be very difficult to find really young nests. So, you know, the stage that 
I'm really focusing on in this talk. So mom founds her nest and is subsocial and exhibiting extended parental care to around the time that her first workers emerge and the nest becomes you social. That period is very fleeting. Um, nests are small. They can be literally just hard to see because they're so small and you don't have all these workers, you know, leaving the nest to forage. Um, and so uh, it's it's ephemeral and it's hard to find. And so this is another reason I think why we don't have as much um, information about this this uh, life stage um, compared to the more mature social colony stage. Um, we can learn some things though in the lineages where we can manipulate and bring queens into the lab or have colonies that produce more queens. And that's one reason why I work on the bumblebees. And then there's some amazing work on Polistes wasps where you can essentially do the same thing. You can bring the queens into the lab and you can study this little pretty ephemeral period. Um, so yeah, like everything, there's a catch, but not, a, not something that can't be overcome, I think. Okay, so I want to talk about some of my work in this area and really continue to sell the power, I think, of independent founding lineages and how we can use them to answer some really interesting questions. And the first, um, one of the first uh, kind of powers of these systems that I mentioned already is this idea that you can actually directly compare maternal and sibling care um, within species. And if you can really manipulate the system you're working in, you can even set things up so you can compare it at the exact same time, um, which is a pretty powerful way to ask questions like, are they regulated similarly or differently? And what are the responses of maternal and sibling care? In, in, in other words, do they shape offspring development um, in different ways? And those are some of the things that I'm gonna talk about. So one of the predictions that I've had and that I um, have been working on a bit is this idea that queens presumably um, might shape, this is a bit adaptatious, but it's it's a thing to test, that queens might shape offspring in ways that benefit early nest growth and survival. So again, when the queen mom is doing the rearing, she's doing this at a time when the nest is really young um, and it's often really early in the season. And so it's possible that she might have effects on her offspring that actually are helpful for the survival of the nest at this early stage. And it bears mentioning too right now that if the nest fails at this stage, you have no workers later in the season and you have no um, new reproductives produced later. And so this is one idea um, to test. And something to tell you about bumblebees, um, the first thing to tell you is this is something that we've known for a while, um, is that um, as queens do most of the care in the beginning, so on this um, graph you can see colony age on the x-axis and the percent of brood care performed by the queen versus the workers on the y. So first I, I've already told you that queens do all the care in the beginning because they, they have no one else to, to do that work. There is no one else to do that work. And so gradually that declines and nurses or workers take over brood care in the nest. So you have this kind of turnover transition. But another pattern to tell you about is that in terrestrial, um, workers also around this earlier stage in nest development become larger as care is provided more um, by workers in the nest relative to the queen. So during early nest development, workers get bigger and that happens around the time that workers take on sibling care within the nest. So I'm gonna tell you that first. We see the same pattern in Bombus impatiens, our common Eastern bumblebee that um, my lab group works um, most with. There is overlap between a queen and a worker reared worker, and I find that really neat. And we're doing some work to try to hone in on the idea that you can uncouple rearing history from body size because the distributions overlap. So I'll just I'll say that. But on average, um, queen reared workers are much smaller than worker reared workers, and we see we've seen that already in terrestrials, and we see it here in impatiens as well. Um, in, in work from my group. But not only that, not only are they smaller, um, queen reared workers are also more resistant to starvation, we have found. So if you take workers that have the only difference, they can even have come from the same natal colony originally, or they were laid by um, sister queens. Um, if you take them and the only difference um, is that they are either reared by a queen or reared by workers. Um, the queen reared workers are able to survive longer. This graph, although the difference here is significant, it might not look that compelling, but I can tell you now that we have run this experiment with many hundreds of workers and see the same thing. So um, 
And in fact, the differences are even more extreme. So under complete food starvation, um, queen reared workers live longer than worker reared workers. And we've been trying to understand why this is, what is what's different about them that allows them um, to, to survive longer. And I'm just gonna share one little tidbit of information um, that we've seen. So one thing we've been looking at is how um, queen and worker reared workers shift between metabolizing different types of nutrients. Um, and uh, what I'm showing you here is only um, glucose levels in the hemolymph. Um, and one thing that we see, I'm gonna point, make this more clear to see, is that um, queen reared workers, if you take them at a certain age of life and you starve them of nectar specifically, and then you measure sugar levels in the blood, Queen reared workers have are able to kind of hold a higher level um, of sugar in the blood under starvation conditions relative to worker reared workers. So at least part of the story um, has something to do <laughs> with how they um, metabolize nutrients. And here I'm showing you specifically sugar um, under starvation conditions. And why that is, we have no idea yet. Um, but at least this is a, a hint into to something that helps explain why they're more starvation resistant. Um, this effect of queen rearing, it might be explained partly by a deficit in care. What I mean by that is when you have a single queen rearing workers, which is the way we've, we've run these experiments for the most part, if you have a single queen rearing workers versus a group of five workers, this is the number of workers on average in the first brood for bumblebees, including for our focal species here. So if you have that setup where you have a single queen or you have five workers, and then you see that the worker reared workers are smaller and more starvation resistant, that might partly be explained by the fact that a queen reared worker receives less care. There actually is some evidence in honeybees that larval um, starvation during the larval period can make adult honeybees more resistant to starvation in adulthood, which would fit with this model that um, maybe if queens are doing the care, they're not doing it as well or as much. Um, I have a little video, hopefully, I think it's going to play, of uh, brood feeding. So you can kind of see um, one of the main types of behaviors associated with brood care that we work on. So here's a queen. She's in a nest. We have a little security camera set up on her. And you're going to see her. She's manipulating a wax envelope that contains the brood. And then you're going to see an arrow pop up any second now. And, yep, there it goes. And when it does, you see her abdomen squish up and then she kind of rears back. That is a single brood feeding event. So she has opened the larval envelope um, and she deposits food and you can see the contraction of the abdomen. And I really like this behavior because it's discreet. You could, she, there's all, there are all kinds of other forms of brood care, but this is a nice one that you can quantify. You can see it easily in the nest. Um, and so it's something that we've been working on quite a bit. So maybe queens just can't feed brood enough or as much as a group of workers can. I think that's a perfectly reasonable um, explanation for why we might see this developmental difference. But I can tell you that we have quantified larval feeding events. <clears throat> and when they're performed with the same number of larvae in the nest, how many times does a single queen feed larvae and how many times does a group of workers? And we don't see a difference in the number of feeding events. And so possibly the effect, there might still be a deficit in care when there's a single queen versus a small group of workers, but it looks like that deficit is not the larvae being fed less often. Um, and I'll just mention, uh, I've said this already, but I'll say it again. I focus really intensively on brood feeding because it's a really nice behavior to watch and quantify and I'm really interested in it. Um, but there are other types of brood care, for example, incubation. And so a single queen probably, or certainly she can't incubate, um, she can't like spread out like a few workers can and incubate brood across the nest. And so it's possible that there are deficits in incubation um, or there maybe there are not deficits at all. Um, but this is kind of where we are right now in trying to understand um, what's driving the effect. I'll just mention, here's another throwback to Morrill Hall. I, I guess this is actually the IGB, but another throwback to Illinois days. Um, another benefit you get when you're, you're able to compare queen and worker or uh, sibling care within one lineage is that you can explore the idea that one might be evolutionarily rooted in the other. So we think that maternal care evolved first and sibling care might have arisen from that evolution being conservative, it tends to recycle stuff. And so if, if maternal 
care and sibling care look really similarly in a system like Polistes, wasps, or bumblebees, then maybe one evolved from the other. And maybe sibling care or originated from a recycling in the um, molecular architecture that already existed for maternal care. And there actually is some evidence for this in Polistes wasps. This is work done by Amy Toth and colleagues where if you look at patterns of brain gene expression in foundress queens, so queens that are either uh, a foundress, so this will be the, the stage that I'm fo really focused on, this nest founding stage, a mature queen, which is what queen means in this figure, and then a gyne, which is a queen who hasn't yet started a nest yet um, and is pre-overwintering. And then you also compare that to a worker who's engaged in sibling care. Um, and then you, you ask, you know, of all these four groups, which, which group, in which groups do patterns of brain gene expression most closely resemble one another? In spite of the fact that the foundress is a member of the queen cast, her brain gene expression looks the most similar to workers, which suggests that there might be an evolutionary link between these two states of being, sibling, a worker doing sibling care and a founder's queen doing um, maternal care. I've used this same kind of framework to test this idea in bumblebees, and I'll just say I did not find evidence for this, but I think um, there are a lot of other ways you can try to test that idea. Okay, I, I also want to talk a little bit more about the ontogeny of sociality and how you can examine it. I'm going to skip over this because I, I can already see I'm, I'm talking. Uh, I, I want to make sure I can cover everything, but and I was going to kind of repeat myself a little here, but I'll just say here are the solitary stages in the life cycle. When queens first found their nest, they become subsocial. And again, when it's only when the first workers emerge in the nest and remain in the nest that they become eusocial. And so again, there are these developmental stages. So another prediction we've been focusing on is the idea that queen reproductive acceleration. So queens first start laying eggs on their own, but there's a thing that happens when the nest continues to develop that the rate of egg laying increases. And so I'm talking about, they've already started laying eggs with this increase. Um, you might predict, I would predict that this reproductive acceleration might be synchronized with the emergence of the first helpers in the nest. The idea being that queens um, would benefit from being able to synchronize and time their increased investment in offspring production with when they're going to have helpers. Again, this is an adaptive prediction and, and who knows, uh, many things are not adaptive, but this is at least an idea to test um, about bumblebee queens. And in fact, we do see some evidence for this. So one thing I can tell you is that when workers um, are in the nest, queens um, increase their egg laying. And that's whether you um, have workers that you've added prematurely, which would be, so the two little arrows pointing down, the one on the left. So this is, these are queens where I've added workers prematurely or whether you just kind of allow things to develop and the workers come out on their own, you see way more eggs in the nest um, when there are workers. Even if you've added them prematurely, you see this premature increase in, in eggs in the nest. So this is data from, these are data from terrestrials. We see the same thing in impatience and we've been drilling down into this effect even more in impatience. So on the left, um, the arrows here too are pointing to places where workers have been added to nests. Um, what we see is that queen ovarian and development increases when workers are present. And part of the explanation for that or, or what's going on there is shown in the right. Um, we see that juvenile hormone, a key, the key gonadotropic hormone um, in insects, it, it, those levels increase when you add workers to the nest. So at least part of the story looks like workers in the nest, um, when they're present, they increase queen JH levels and that causes an increase in ovarian development. And we're drilling down more into this and we think we maybe even know what Q workers are providing. Um, and I'll just kind of leave that as a, a teaser for today. Um, but I, it, looks, it looks pretty clear to me that workers are causing queens to increase their reproduction. There's an original Q, but then downstream of that, it's the way that um, reproductive acceleration would be predicted to happen. You see an increase in levels of this hormone. Um, I just want to mention this too, um, that we are also seeing a really interesting pattern. This is an impatience queens. And this, the sample size here, I think is somewhere near a hundred queens. 
Um, so what we've done here is shown from the first day an egg cup is present in the nest through day 45 in nest development. How many new egg cups are you seeing in the nest um, each day? And something that we found is that queens have a little pause. They take a pause where they've started laying eggs and then they uh, significantly reduce their egg laying rate and then it increases again. And then, and, I mean, really interestingly and stereotypically, we also see some interesting stuff going on from day around day 21, 22 um, as well. But I just want to focus on the part on the left here, this little complete kind of decline in egg laying. Um, and we're looking at how this um, these patterns of egg laying in the nest appear to be shaped by um, who is in the nest at that time. And I'm going to leave it at that as well and have that as kind of a teaser. But we think this too. Uh, reflects a pattern where queen reproduction is influenced by who's in the nest and specifically whether there are helpers um, in the nest. Another prediction um, that uh, we found has been met is that you, you might also expect that queen brood care would be socially regulated. So here I just talked about reproduction and egg laying. Now I'm talking about the expression of brood care by queens. Um, you might also expect that as workers emerge in the nest, and even if you add workers artificially to the nest, queens should stop doing um, brood care behavior. The idea being in part that when they're not doing that work in the nest, they might be more able to um, specialize on reproduction, something we know actually does happen along this kind of period in the life cycle. Um, and we do see this as well. So in terrestrials, if you add workers to the nest and the two lines on the bottom are essentially a nest where you, I've either added them prematurely um, or they've come out kind of naturally over the course of nest development. Um, in both cases, if you look across this period, um, if, you, if you quantify how much brood feeding queens are doing, there's a significant reduction when workers are in the nest. And again, I, a hypothesis is that queens that are um, doing less brood care are better able to specialize in reproduction. Um, we've also drilled down a little bit more into this phenomenon, and we see that um, if you take queens that are um, either, we're calling them subsocial um, on these figures, so these would be queens without workers having to do the work on their own. If you compare queens on their own to queens who have three workers in the nest or five workers in the nest, and we created these three groups to kind of uh, resemble early nest development. Um, if you look at the performance of queen brood care behavior, um, and here I'm not only showing brood feeding on the right, but also just brood manipulation, which is we define in our study as just an interaction with the brood and antenating or, or touching the brood, or incubation. Um, if you look at those all three behaviors, when queens have just three helpers in the nest, they significantly reduce their performance of brood care. But with adding two more workers, so having a little bit more help, um, we didn't see a difference or a further reduction in brood care when we when we made that um, change in social configuration. So what it looks like is that queens, when they have even just a little bit of help in the nest, even smaller than, as I mentioned, the average um, first brood size, they already stop, um, sorry, they don't stop. <laughs> they already reduce their brood feeding and other types of brood care behavior. Um, they can They keep doing it, at least through when they have five workers, but they do reduce when they're just two. Um, another idea, and this one, I just want to make the point that I'm, I'm really interested in this idea, that queens should also be risk aversive, um, but a lot of the work we have in this area is from the lab, and I recognize that it's hard to study risk aversion in a lab setting, so I just want to Make, mention that caveat up front. Um, but another prediction about queens is that they should, in theory, be risk aversive. You know, if the queen dies, then that's it for the nest. Um, so queens, in theory, uh, as soon as helpers are in the nest, um, we might predict that they would stop collecting food and leaving the nest um, as soon as possible because many things can happen when they're out you're out there in the scary world and outside of the nest. So this is another prediction I'm really interested in. I'm going to show you like a little hint that this might be the case. Um, one thing we've been doing, um, and this is not with lab queens, this is with wild queens, um, a former student in the lab um, Erica Serra was um, trap nesting bumblebee queens out at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab and putting um, RFID tags and readers setups on their nests. Um, one thing I can say, and I'm showing you data just from two queens, but um, 
we have data from more queens, although trap nesting is quite difficult and the sample sizes are low. Um, but queens, from the data we have, we can say that queens keep very busy. They basically forage nonstop when the weather permits. So I'm showing you two days in the life of two queens. Um, and they're basically in and out of the nest nonstop collecting food um, or at least leaving the nest and presumably collecting food. The queens are, I mean, this just looking at this, I, I can I can sympathize. This is a queen that's constantly leaving, collecting food and then coming back. And remember, she has no help at this stage, or, or I'll tell you now, she has no helpers in the nest yet at this stage. So she's not only going out and collecting the food, she's also doing all incubation in the nest, all brood feeding, all nest maintenance and she's doing all this foraging. So you can imagine then that um, given the opportunity, you might see that queens cease doing this extremely energetically costly um, activity. And now I'm gonna show you some results from a lab experiment that begin to support that. So this is from the same experiment I showed in the uh, slide before last, um, where we have queens that are either subsocial, meaning all on their own, no help, or they have three workers or they have five. When we create these three configurations and then we look at food collection behavior. So again, this is a lab setup. These queens are not free foraging, but they are leaving the, the enclosed dark nest box, entering a lighted foraging chamber and collecting either pollen or nectar. So when we set that up and then we look at how their behavior differs when they have help or not and different uh, numbers of helpers, what we see is that queens, unlike with the brood care behavior, in the nest, when they have three helpers, it looks like it's trending towards a reduction in food collection um, from between the subsocial and the queens with three workers groups, but the uh, difference is not significant. So three is not sufficient here when it comes to food collection. But when you have five workers in the nest, bam, the food collecting behavior just almost completely stops. They they keep going a bit, but I mean the, the difference is really dramatic. And so you can almost separate brood care in the nest from food collection outside of the nest and say that um, when it comes to brood care within the nest, just having a, a few, three helpers is sufficient to cause a reduction in that, but they, they keep doing it past having five workers. But when it comes to food collection, which is the riskier, and again, I recognize this isn't a fully contained setup, but at least hints at it. Um, when they when it comes to the food collection behavior where they're having to leave the little nest box that we're holding them in, three workers is not sufficient to reduce their behavior, but as soon as they have um, five helpers in the nest, there's a really abrupt change. So I take this as meaning that queen behavior during the early nest founding stage is socially regulated, and I would say it's tightly socially regulated. So a difference of um, one to two workers can cause a really dramatic change in queen behavior. And I'll just hypothesize here that um, th at this really early nesting stage, selective pressure is probably pretty intense and having helpers and a certain number of helpers, I could imagine how that might have shaped um, changes in queen behavior. Um, and so uh, I think that gives us some insight. And on that note, um, now I wanna transition to talking even more speculatively, but something I'm really interested in, the idea that independent, independent founding might help us um, understand some things about um, species uh, declines and population declines. Um, this figure is very poignant. Um, these, this is Robin Thorpe's hand, um, one of our heroes of Bumblebee uh, world, and he's showing a, a box that includes um, Bombus franklini and Bombus occidentalis, two species that have declined precipitously and now are at different stages of ending up on our federal endangered species list. There are many other bumblebees that are declining, um, you know, an estimated more than a third of species, but I, I can just tell you there are many other species that we might not declare them officially threatened or endangered, but um, we have evidence here in California or others have evidence from elsewhere that they're still being lost from parts of the range um, or they're declining in relative abundance, et cetera. So I, I think everyone would agree that bumblebees are um, in trouble. And um, some of the other independent founding lineages, unfortunately, are not as well studied. So Polistes wasps, for example, we know a lot less about the status of those populations. And so, um, but bumblebees, we do have pretty good evidence for. Um, and I'll say one thing too that I mentioned earlier, but um, I think bears mentioning again, is that 
a lot of these independent founding lineages um, in temperate areas, at least the time when they're being single moms and transitioning to youth sociality um, and getting their nest going and don't have any of those benefits of having a big, amazing youth social colony. They're doing this really early in the season, often when food resources tend to be less abundant, less stable, weather patterns are less predictable, et cetera. And so these queens are, are nest founding um, on their own at a time of year when food resources can be less um, predictable and abundant. And just hearkening back to the first story I told you about starvation resistance and queen reared workers, um, it's possible that that is one trait that's been shaped by this kind of feature of the timing, the phenology of, of independent founding. Um, so that's that's just something to mention that all of this is as difficult as it seems for a, a single queen to, to get going and start her nest and have to do all the work before she's released from some of that by the the development of youth sociality, that all that is also mapped onto a time of year um, that can be a harder time for, for an insect, um, I think is really um, compelling. Um, I, yeah, and I think, as I mentioned, I think this is, could be true for Polistes um, wasps as well, although, as I said, I don't think we have as, as solid a data um, for this group. Um, to make the argument that independent founding can be risky, I'll just bring the slide back up again and say dependent founding has evolved multiple times, which, which suggests at least that it is uh, could be something that is helpful for um, species persistence. So the idea again of not founding on your own, but instead founding with helpers already right there with you. Um, I think the pattern in the phylogeny suggests that um, independent founding is a risky strategy. Um, and I'll mention too, I mentioned these already, but mul multiple founders associations are kind of like a secondary thing that's evolved um, multiple times. Um, this is where uh, multiple queens, um, sometimes not related at all, will found a nest um, together. And one of them uh, will not uh, be the queen. <laughs> there can only be one queen. And so they start the nest together and then one ultimately becomes the queen. Um, so in spite of that, we still see the strategy evolving. Um, it has evolved multiple times. That, to me, I take that as another piece of evidence that independent founding in some lineages under some context might be a risky strategy. I'll just say, I, I understand all, I've, all except for the parasitic lineages, um, well, even those technically, um, you know, they are, bumblebees are exposed to the same independent founding situation. Um, and so obviously that can't completely on its own explain decline. I totally get that. In fact, you know, the, the factors um, explaining or driving bumblebee decline are really multifaceted. In this figure from a great paper, I'm showing you a figure that demonstrates, looks like there's some phylogenetic component to it. There are other life history characteristics that are associated with decline. And so I'm definitely not saying that independent founding explains everything, but I do think it's at least a life stage we should be looking at as carefully as possible to try to understand how it um, relates to decline, and not only in bumblebees, but of course in, in other lineages um, as well. So I just want to say that, but I do think, you know, it's a shame that, as I mentioned, it's a life stage that's so hard to study um, because it's happening so early in the season and nests are so small. Um, I think if we could collect more data on this life stage and how species that independent found, the status of those species versus dependent founding, I think we might be able to learn some interesting things about how challenging this way of life is um, for these lineages. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that the independent founding lineages allow us to answer some, or at least pose some, some really interesting questions about social organization, behavior, evolution, even the intersection between sociality and conservation. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm fascinated with these ideas, um, and uh, I am so fascinated that um, I'm going to be, uh, or I am preparing and will be um, uh, releasing an article on this idea in Annual Review of Entomology uh, next year. So um, if anyone has any, like, cool ideas or wants to talk about this at all and has any work on this area and wants to make sure it's included, by all means, email me. I can put my email in the chat. For sure, if you know much about termites and independent founding, we definitely, you could see that in the figure. Um, I think less is known overall about that. And I 
definitely have a lot to learn um, in that area. So um, yeah, if, reach out if you have anything you want to make sure is is included or addressed, or if you have any any interesting thoughts to share, I'd love to hear them. Um, I want to thank all the amazing people that I work with who did um, most of this work. Um, Claudine Acosta is a postdoc in the lab. Um, she's done a lot of the work on how maternal and sibling care shape development. Um, Blanca Petto has done the work on the pause in Queens. Megan's working on um, the uh, social regulation of queen reproduction by workers. And Erica did the cool work on um, RFID tagging in queens and how helpers in the nest influences queen um, brood care and, or uh, yeah, brood care in the nest and, and food collection behavior. And a big thanks to, to the additional collaborators on the work, Guy Block, Naoki Yamanaka here at UCR and my PhD advisor, Jean Robinson, because some of the work that I mentioned is actually all the way from my PhD from that long ago. Um, and I just want to plug something too that Amro mentioned. Um, and uh, this is an effort I'm leading. In many ways, this was inspired by thinking about independent founding and thinking about how life history and really digging into that can, can potentially tell us something about conservation status and maybe even protection of threatened species. Um, I'm leading this effort to develop a national strategy for the US for native bee monitoring. Um, this effort is something you can visit our new uh, website and you can also email Brianne DeClo. Um, they are the project manager and can add you to our email list. It, we're, it's a US strategy, but I'm really interested in the idea of working with folks from other places to um, coordinate and strategize together. And so if you're interested in learning more about the project and even better participating in it, because everyone's welcome, um, feel free to email um, Brianne and, and get added to the, to the email list and join us for our meetings. And I think with that, that's my last slide. Yep. Um, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity again. Um, and with that, I can take any questions. Thanks so much, Wallace, for that uh, excellent talk. That was definitely of interest to sure everyone, certainly to me. Um, I'll take any questions. I think we already have two here. So uh, my name is Jesse Huskin, by the way, and I'll be moderating this section. Um, Janis Bokalar asks, um, could queen reared workers also have more fat than worker reared workers? And yes. Yeah. And I have a couple more questions. So I'll, after that, I'll, I'll offer those as well. Yeah. Um, we're also looking at that. There is evidence from another research group um, in that works on bumblebees that um, in mature colonies, smaller bodied bees, worker bees, um, in impatience have higher fat levels. Um, and um, so in some ways, I think that's the simplest explanation for why queen reared workers might be more starvation resistant. Um, and so we have looked at that as well. Um, and I think um, Claude Genea, who's leading that project, is actually still analyzing those data. So we, we looked at two things, one being a bit more of a complicated explanation, the other being more straightforward. Um, so I can tell you later if they have higher fat levels. Um, but um, we also looked at this more complex explanation that they can shift between metabolizing nutrients and we do see that so far but i totally i think that could easily be part of the explanation too that they just have higher fat levels so he was also wondering uh would this be advantage advantageous in spring season to keep warmer the early i guess the earlier founded uh the earlier reared queen reared yeah yeah, totally. I tend to think of it as being about um, starvation resistance, but that's a really good point that it might also impact their ability to withstand more varied temperature conditions too. That's a cool idea and that could be tested. So thanks. I love that idea. Jens has some other comments that you can read in the chat when we're done. Okay. Um, so uh, Benjamin Kenson, uh, my colleague in the Rehan lab asks, uh, first of all, a great talk. And I agree, nice drawings. Uh, do you think it's worth partitioning independent foundation by the dispersal distance? Oh yeah, um, I wish we knew that <laughs> for most species, but I totally, yeah, there's this whole other thing I'm really interested in and that's um, the experience of the queen pr even prior to overwintering, during overwintering, and then when she's dispersing, some of which might actually happen before overwintering and some might happen after, so, or both. Um, 
I think it's entirely possible that the experience and condition of the queen before she even has to do this whole founding thing could also be really, it could help explain a lot in, in terms of nest survival. And there, there is a little, little bit of data, a few studies on that in, um, in bumblebees. And um, I can't think offhand of any implicities. And so, which are the two best studied groups that have this way of life. Um, so yeah, I would, but when it comes to dispersal specifically, we have so little information and we can't really easily manipulate that in the lab. And even if we could using flight mills or whatever, it would be pretty artificially contrived. So, um, but I, I just, my, my gut sense is this, is that that could totally be a big piece of it too. Yep. The idea being that if you have to travel farther, if you do travel farther, that could impact your ability, your reserve, nutritional reserves, et cetera. Yep. Okay. It doesn't look like we have another question. Oh, here we go. One just came in. So could increase, uh, Dustin Van Overbeek uh, asks, um, could increased egg laying be due to more feeding slash help by workers or less foraging energy used by the queen uh, foraging overall? Yeah, I think about this a lot. I think, you know, resource and energy budgets are complex and um, there are all kinds of things that happen when the when the workers emerge in the nest. It's not only that the queen's not having to perform or she does not perform as much brood feeding. And so maybe she's like saving more energy, um, but it's also time, you know, it's time that she's not having to um, go collect food could be time she instead incubates and maybe that's less energetically costly. So there's the time resource. Um, the workers are also out there collecting food. So you have more food coming into the nest too. So I, I think in reality, um, the emergence of the workers totally offsets the, the queen's energy slash resource budget in a lot of different ways. And I'm definitely interested in trying to figure out how to tease apart those things and separate them out. Cause I think they're all at play and yeah. Have you tried, Dustin also asked, have you tried taking workers away before emergence to see if egg laying does not increase? Taking workers away. Um, I actually did that with terrestrials and you can see it go in both directions. So you see that she lays fewer eggs if you take away her workers um, or if you never let them stay in the nest. And then it, it's, so it's totally bi-directional, the, the effect on egg laying and the effect on brood feeding and they totally track one another. So at the individual level, queens that feed less lay more eggs and vice versa. And he also suggests maybe separating them early and only reintroducing their pheromones. Pheromone. Yeah, that's something we're doing, <laughs> but I love that, I, that idea. Yeah, yeah, because there's also like, what is it about the workers? Is it their actual contribution to the work or is it merely their presence? Um, is a question that we're very interested in and working on. So we still have time for questions if anyone so it looks like we don't have any further questions. So 